Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Piera Freccero, and I'm director of program of War Child Cancer. It is my privilege to welcome you to this uh, webinar today that has been organized jointly by War Child Cancer and, and SIOP in the context of the London Global Cancer Week. Today, we will be talking about new global initiative to improve access and quality of essential medicine for child cancer in low and middle income countries. And, you know, as you know, the access to, to medicine is a, is a critical challenge to reduce the cancer survival gap uh, between children with cancer in, uh, in low and middle income countries and, and those in high income countries. Um, and it is critical, the consistent supply of reliable, good quality and effective, affordable uh, essential medicine for curative, supportive uh, and palliative care in low and middle income countries. So so today, this session, this interactive session, we'll, uh, we will have a number of different voices from users, providers and international organizations that are involved uh, to try to, to improve the situation. We will be looking at the present and current situation uh, regarding the access to essential medicine in low and middle income countries. We will be discussing new initiatives, new very exciting initiatives uh, that are aiming at improving uh, the affordable provision on high quality medicine in low and middle income countries. And hopefully we will have the, the opportunity to discuss on how uh, best this initiative can, uh, can interact between each other. We will look also at the role uh, of international uh, and national local civil society organization. And uh, uh, we will pre pre present some examples from, uh, from Africa uh, and, uh, and Latin America. At the end, there will be uh, a panel discussion uh, and a question and answer with the, with the audience. Before I take you through the agenda, I just wanted to do some uh, simple housekeeping. I uh, just wanted to say uh, that uh, please, if you have any question, uh, don't hesitate to drop them in the question and answer in the question and answer box. Uh, all the audience are currently muted, but you can still um, raise your hand uh, and you can have a conversation with the with the organizers. And the question that you put in the box uh, will be uh, answered by the speakers or discussed in um, in the um, in the question and answer. Uh, session at the end of the webinar. I will now then take you through quickly the agenda be, before we start. The first speaker is going to be uh, Mr. Daniel McKenzie, which is the executive director of uh, Kids Can in Zimbabwe. He will talk about the situation in Zimbabwe in terms of essential medicine and what they are doing to improve it. He will be followed by Professor Gilles Vassal, which is the head of pediatric research program at Gustave Roussy Comprehensive Cancer Center in France. He'll be talking to us about the WHO essential medicine uh, list. Then uh, there will be Dr. Andre Ilbawi, the Cancer Control Officer at the Department of Non-Communicable Diseases Division at the World Health Organization. And he will be introducing us to the WHO St. Jude Global Platform to Access for Childhood Cancer Medicine. He'll be followed by Mrs. Melissa Rendler-Garcia, the Senior Advisor uh, and Atom Coalition Project Lead at UICC. And she will introduce us to the UICC Atom Project and their implementation plans. Then we will have Adele Patterson, the CEO of International Health Partners, and she'll be talking about how International Health Partners is currently bridging the gap uh, in the supply of pediatric oncology medicine, also in collaboration with World Child Cancer. Uh, we will have then our friend and colleague, Dr. George Chakaluga, um, Head of Pediatrics at Queen Elizabeth Central uh, Hospital in Blantyre, Malawi, and he'll talk about uh, the, uh, the essential medicine for pediatric cancer situation in Malawi. And then we will have uh, Dr. Liliana Vasquez, the immediate past president of uh, SIOP Latin America and consultant of the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer. Uh, that she will take us to uh, the essential medicine situation in, uh, in Latin America and in the Caribbean. As I was mentioning before, 
the, uh, the webinar will then have a panel discussion and a question and answer uh, with, the, with the audience that will be moderated by Professor Cathy Pritchard Jones, immediate past president of SIOP, and opened by Professor Guillermo Chantada, current SIOP president. I thank you all very much for being here and, um, and I hope you enjoy the webinar. I will introduce now Daniel McKenzie from Zimbabwe Kids. Thank you. It is a very good morning to you all. My name is Daniel McKenzie. I'm the Executive Director for Kids Can Zimbabwe and also Board Member for Childhood Cancer International. And a very privileged and honored to be here to make this presentation looking at access to global medication. I want to share the story of KidsCan, what's the problem, and how we here in Zimbabwe are working around it. Well, KidsCan is the only non-profit that supports childhood cancer in Zimbabwe, originally set up to provide psychosocial support to children undergoing treatment. But due to the social economic climate and challenges within the public health system, this has resulted in KidsCan having to outsource services that have not been available within the public health system. Our mission and vision is to increase the survival rate of children suffering from cancer, ensuring the utmost quality of care. And as you can see there on this PowerPoint is that initially raising awareness through different campaigns has led to more children coming through and presenting. And as a result of the situation within the health system, we've had to change our mandate to start supporting with clinical services. And these include chemotherapy, drugs, prosthetics, radiological, pathology, pathological and laboratory diagnostic services. And we also support with transport costs for both patient and caregiver. Without these services, no child and no family would be able to support their families undergoing cancer treatment. Since 2009, when we were established, we've supported just over 6,000 children. And currently we are registering about 250 new cases every year. But what is the situation in Zimbabwe in our history? The evolution of drug procurement. KidsCan began by purchasing drugs from NatFarm, a government supplier with wide variety and at a low cost. But in 2017, this stopped because of shortages and also unreliable supply and also lack of foreign currency on their part. We then had to purchase drugs from the private pharmaceuticals who had the stock, but unfortunately, Due to the cost and inflation within the country, this was not sustainable. We asked for permission to import from the Ministry of Health and Child Care, which was granted. And again, these drugs were then stored and dispersed by one of our local partners, a local pharmaceutical company. But the challenges with this was the long wait times and the costly process of freight clearance and also storage. We also have been receiving uh, donations from um, NCCS, which is National Cancer um, Children's Society, in America. So that is sort of the general scope of what has been happening in Zimbabwe. Then if we just look at the challenges that we've been facing is obviously the access to medication and costs for our patients and families. And again, I must hasten to say that this also includes access to medication for church-run uh, foundations. And uh, these are the preferred service providers in Zimbabwe. Again, the challenge is, is lack of government support. Although we are and have been lobbying to government um, for support uh, to ensure that we get allocation from the fiscus, knowing that Zimbabwe is now a focused country. And also access to information, both for clinicians and also to the public. Aggressive training for medical personnel, doctors and nurses. Although you know, I'm, I'm happy to say we now have uh, three qualified oncologists in the ward that we support. Uh, we're both trained um, in Red Cross International in Cape Town and also a Baraguana in, in Johannesburg. But the challenge that we have there is that they've trained in the first world settings and they come back home and they don't have the tools. And this is where we then come in to try and make sure that we provide them with those tools. We have a challenge again of brain drain. Many of our clinicians are leaving the country for greener pastures. And also we are trying to raise as much awareness as possible because the challenge that we have is that many of our communities do not know that children get cancer. So just to give you a you know, a, a brief on, on, on how we operate as a foundation. Our clinical team makes uh, ward rounds with the hospital staff on a daily basis where scripts are generated. They're brought to KidsCan, entered in our database. We then take those scripts to our partner pharmacy who then prescribes the medication and we take it back or dispenses the medication and we then take it back to the hospital. 
we also again use stock that has been donated to us. So this is a round robin uh, process that happens uh, twice a week. And um, so far it's been working very well. Now, in order to maintain drug access, we've had to think out of the house. We have a policy here that we don't think out of the box, but we think out of the house. And so we had to create partnerships to make this sustainable. Yes, our main key objective in terms of fundraising is, is, is local events. 75% of our budget is local. We're also glad to share that we are part of uh, the St. Jude and LSAT Global Alliance uh, uh, program, um, where we also um, had uh, our staff who are currently on the Global Scholars Program. Um, I graduated um, in 2021. And again, this is all on fundraising and giving us the tools to try and increase, increase in our capacity. We've also advocated um, with um, and WHO in expanding through advocacy, not only just at national, but also to international government partners. We've reached out to WHO the country rep, seeking assistance on engaging um, the Ministry of Health and Child Care. Um, and kids can put together a plan to lobby for Zimbabwe to be considered and selected for WHO GIC status. And as you know, we are now the fourth focus country. We've also uh, partnered with non-traditional donors. We all know that uh, you know, AIDS campaigns have done very well uh, in most of our countries here in Africa. So we approached the National AIDS Council. Uh, in Zimbabwe, we have a 3% uh, corporate um, AIDS levy. Um, so there is funding there. And again, we're very fortunate that uh, the National AIDS Council has partnered with us and uh, now supports us um, in the payment significantly for diagnostics and also for chemotherapy drugs. And again, our major partner is the Ministry of Health and Child Care, where we have an MOU with them that allows us to support four hospitals in Zimbabwe, one which is the A4 Special Ward that we've adopted at Parinato Hospital and support 100%. We have an MOU with them and also the Ministry um, supports us with a duty rebate on all drugs that we import. And uh, at the top there, we also have a partnership with the Medicines Control Board, which is MCAS that issues us with a section 75 that allows us to import um, these chemotherapy drugs um, having gone through uh, the necessary processes. We also have a donation and are a partner of uh, NCCS in America where they support us with drugs that have a uh, shelf life on, of no less than uh, six months. And again, like I said, we work within four hospitals, uh, but more so we have a local partner pharmacy who um, keeps the medication that we purchase and also dispenses it pro bono. And she's been doing this year for the last 14 years. So this is the process and that is what we have done to maintain um, access to medication and make sure that we support the doctors that we have in the ward. So again, just looking at the future, I'm always a dreamer and I love to live my dream. Um, and I'm just saying, imagine if our government um, could finally support us uh, through the fiscus, especially to support the zero to five years, um, now that Zimbabwe is a focused country, how much this would help us as a, a foundation to now reduce our budget to um, support our children in other areas. Again, imagine if through the St. Jude Drug Initiative, Zimbabwe was chosen as a beneficiary. And also again, if, imagine if we could consider a global fund for cancer medicines, creating equity. So I'm just saying that today, let's be the first initiative to make sure the world is equal and reaches the WHO GICC target of 2030. I always say that children are children, irrespective of where they are born. Cancer is cancer. Treatments are the same. It's time we close the gap of the haves and the have-nots. In conclusion, I'd just like to share with you a video just to showcase that, you know, despite all these challenges in Zimbabwe, we have been thinking out of the box. Imagine what we could do for our patients in Zimbabwe if we were able to get more access from all the different stakeholders. Please just uh, note that this video has no voiceover, so just please um, read through the transcripts.
And I'm also just glad to announce that uh, we've just moved in to the home this very day, and we will be having a launch on the 1st of December. For this, I thank you, and I'm uh, willing to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, for that excellent video. I really apologise for the technical problems of playing it. Uh, Daniel, would you like to add any uh, final comments? I'm sorry we might have missed some of your key messages at the beginning. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, again, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, how much people heard at um, uh, the, the beginning, but I think um, our situation in, in Zimbabwe is very different in, in the sense that um, we, we support basically from start to, 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 to finish uh, in the sense that we support with bus fares, admission packs, uh, diagnostics, um, the chemotherapy itself, um, nutritional support, and I think most of you are aware that you know uh, our our um, health system uh, is in need of, of support at the moment, and and we're having challenges in the sense that you know all diagnostics and and medication has to be outsourced, um, and 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 this is one of the things that you know, we are doing to make sure that every single child um, um, receives treatment. But again, like there, you saw that uh, it's about partnerships. And uh, we've had to think out of the box to make sure that, you know, access to drugs is sustainable, despite the fact that we get, you know, lack of support from the key stakeholders. And, and I'm just saying that if we can do it, then, you know, all other foundations and other countries as well, as long as you create partnerships, especially with the country reps from WHO, um, they, they are supporting us immensely. And I'm sure they're willing to do the same in all other countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. So to everyone online, if you've got any specific questions for an individual speaker, um, please add them in the Q&A and we'll bring them up in the panel discussion. So I'm Cathy Pritchard-Jones. I'm the immediate past president of SIOP. Uh, I'm very pleased that we can co-host this webinar together with our colleagues in World Child Cancer who have a tremendous programme of support in many countries. I'd now like to introduce the next speaker who will speak live, Professor Gilles Vassal. He is the um, head of uh, research uh, at the uh, Gustave Roussy Comprehensive Cancer Centre in Villejuif, uh, just outside Paris in France. Uh, Gilles was a past president of SIOP Europe, and he has recently published a very nice piece of work led by SIOP Europe, looking at access to the essential medicines uh, list for children with cancer in Europe. So, Gilles, over to you. Uh, I know you're presenting. Thank you very much, Cathy. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to participate to this webinar and discuss with you the WHO essential medicines to cure children with cancer. As you know, each year, 400,000 children are diagnosed with cancer. In the low and middle income countries, the probability of cures range from 15 to 45 percent, with a major objective and challenge to give access to all children to standard of care and treatments. In high income countries, the probability of survival at five years is 80 percent, but with major differences across malignancies, but also across countries meaning that cancer is the leading cause still of deaths from disease beyond one year of age, with, for example, in Europe, 6,000 days. So the goal is to cure more children, to cure them better, and to tackle inequalities. The Global Initiative on Childhood Cancer from the WHO has an objective of saving one million children's life from cancer by 2030. To do so, there is a need to access to essential medicines, to access to innovative medicines. This is necessary, but not sufficient. As highlighted by Daniel McKenzie, need to access diagnostics, surgery, therapy, supportive care, medicine, supportive care, psychological care. But access to essential medicine is absolutely crucial to provide cure for these children, which are, who have chemotherapy sensitive disease. What is an essential medicine? The essential medicine list by WHO is revised every other year. The very first one was in 1977, and currently this is a second version. The essential medicine list for children, all diseases, including cancer, was started in 2007, 30 years later. And currently this is the eighth version. What is an essential medicine? It's a medicine which satisfies the priority healthcare needs of the population, 
and which is which is intended to be available at all times in adequate number amounts in the appropriate dosage of assured quality and at prices that individuals and communities can afford. As part of a European program called Joint Action on Rare Cancer, Sayup Europe surveyed access to essential anti-cancer medicine for children and adolescents in Europe across 35 Sayup Europe countries. This project was performed in partnership with the European Society of Oncopharmacy, with the European Society of Medical Oncology, and with CCI Europe. From this survey, we identified that 35% of medicine used in Europe as essential are prescribed off-label. Only 44% of them were always available in more than 90 countries. And the main issue was shortages, reported in sep for 72% of medicine, at least in one country. And you can see on the right hand side, the lowest is the gross national income per capita, the highest in the number of shortages. The second issue was financial accessibility with out pocket costs in eight countries for the family. The third issue was the lack of safe age-appropriate formulation for 27% of oral medicines. And finally, inequalities in access to supportive care and pain management medicine across Europe. We complemented this work by defining what are, through evidence, the essential medicine to cure children. And this is a paper that has been published last week in the Lancet of Oncology. We did a systematic collection and review of 73 treatment protocols, which are the standard treatments used across Europe for children and adolescents with cancer. This was done by 33 young CIOP members and 21 experts from the European clinical trial groups. This survey and this evidence complement analysis define 66, 66 essential medicine as essential. Of those, 33% are or were on the WHO medicine list of 2017. From this, we contributed to the, the revision of this essential medicine list for children with cancer in 2021. Now, the low grade glioma are on the list. It is one of the six diseases addressed by the Global Initiative on Childhood Cancer. There are two new medicines, Everolim Everolimus and Vinorelbin, and a better definition of which disease are treated with the already described WHO medicines on the WHO list. And at the moment, we are preparing the contribution to the 2023. But this work is also important for us really to advocate the need of essential medicine for all children and adolescents 24 hours a day and seven days a week across Europe but also to advocate for access to affordable, innovative medicine for all children and adolescents in a timely fashion across Europe. So without that, I would like just to thank the Essential Medicine team, the young CIOP investigators and experts, as well as the steering committee with the people from the CIOP Europe and from CCI Europe. And I would like to thank you for your kind intention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gilles, for giving us an overview of this tremendous piece of work uh, led in Europe, and I think will be useful globally. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you uh, in the panel discussion. I'd like to move on to Melissa, um, who is uh, the senior advisor, Melissa Rendler Garcia, senior advisor and uh, Atom Coalition project lead at the um, International based in Geneva. Uh, Melissa, over to you. Hi, everyone. Well, I hope that the gods and goddesses of the internet and telecommunications will be kinder to me. Um, the SIOP team have asked me to share the video directly to see whether the sound is a little bit easier. So I'm going to try that now. Please let me know if you can hear it. Hi, my name is Melissa Renda Garcia. I am Senior Advisor at UICC and Project Lead for the Access to Oncology Medicines or ADAM Coalition. So before I start the presentation describing the coalition and how we started, I thought it was important first 
to give a little bit of context about what the issues and challenges are related to access to oncology medicines in general. We know that access to oncology medicines around the world is still a challenge for many cancer patients, even for patients that live in high income settings. But for patients that live in resource constrained settings, it's even more challenging, especially when you look at the relative burden of cancer in low and lower middle income countries. So we know that you know, in 2020, approximately 10 million people died of cancer, and 70% of those deaths occurred in low and middle income countries. And that percentage is actually expected to increase in the next 10 years. But sadly, there's very limited availability currently of essential cancer medicines, as listed by the WHO model list of essential medicines available in these countries. Access to medicines, not only access to cancer medicines, is a priority for all of us, right? Obviously, one of the key roadblocks and barriers for access to cancer medicines is price, right? But it isn't the only one. Particularly for low and middle income countries, those roadblocks are multidimensional. You know, there include regulatory challenges, political cultural challenges, insufficient healthcare workforce, but also access to the diagnostics that are needed, as well as chemotherapies and supportive care. As I've mentioned before, there are many organizations that are working on access but many have different objectives and aren't necessarily aligned or co coordinated. Priority will always be placed on access to those essential generic medicines, but even you know, access to the patented meds is also a challenge. You know, those donation schemes are very limited. So based on what the current context is in reality, UICC began to do some initial research and outreach to some key organizations across sectors to look at how we as an organization can actually help address some of these access barriers and develop a new model to really improve and increase access for the most vulnerable. You know, UICC has always prioritized equity in cancer care and control around the world. We've worked closely with WHO, particularly to help increase the list of oncology medicines available on, on the essential medicines list. We've also organized and initiated a lot of different organizations with track record now really addressing key aspects related to cancer care and control. City Cancer Challenge, the NCD Alliance, uh, NCD Alliance ICCI, uh, the McCabe Center for Cancer and Law. So we felt that we were best placed to be able to use our convening power and our track record to be able to convene stakeholders to really look at how we can define and look at the issue and develop a model that really will look at access. So for the last year and a half, UICC and its partners have done a series of workshops to help define what kind of initiative we would want to establish to address these access issues um, and also research and convening some expert advisory groups to help us along the way. So based on that, the Adam Coalition was launched in May of this year. And what is the coalition? The coalition is an innovative partnership of over 30 organizations who have all committed to wanting to not only improve access to life-saving cancer medicines and diagnostics, but also increase the capacity and the training on the appropriate use of these medicines and technologies. The coalition was established by UICC and its partners, those who have track record and expertise in access to medicines, the idea is we use the Adam Coalition as an umbrella to be able to increase the scale and sustainability of existing access initiatives, building on all of our partners' assets and programs, but also coordinating efforts across multiple target countries by pooling resources and know-how together in an unprecedented way. So our ambition is similar to everyone's ambition within the cancer control uh, space. You know, we wanna reduce avoidable suffering and deaths caused by cancer, but we wanna do that in low and lower middle income countries through both increasing the supply of medicines, but also providing capacity building on training and their use. Now, when we talk about our partners, at this point, we have over 37 organizations that have signed up and committed to be part of Adam. And as you see from the list of partners, at which is also growing, it really does represent an array of organizations across sectors. So it really is very heartening for us to see what the reaction has been to Adam since we began these discussions over a year and a half ago. So what will the coalition work on? Right. So part of the work that we've done over the last year is really to, to define what our key objectives are, and they are three. So first is to implement, improve capacity building to receive and use those cancer medicines. We will provide support to develop intense coordinated capacity building for our partners who are already working, both international partners and partners that are in those countries you know, capacity building to receive and use medicines. We will begin capacity building in a very phased approach within the Adam group of countries. We will start with four to five in the beginning as we launch the initiative. 
but also extending those out to over 40 over time. In parallel, we want to increase access to the key generic uh, and biosimilar cancers on the WHO EML by working with our generic manufacturers and looking at the Atom Coalition countries as a whole, a collective group of countries to be able to negotiate volume discounts for the pool of countries, but also working on some key access barriers, including you know, our ambition is to help simplify registration process for some of these medicines. And as well, working with our biopharma partners to increase access to patented meds that are on the EML, but also new medicines that may be available over time through a variety of channels. That could be through donations, discounted pricing, but also looking at the possibility of securing voluntary licenses for some of these medicines. You know, many of you may have heard that, you know, during the World Cancer Congress, Novartis announced the first voluntary license for a cancer med ever developed, you know, and that was done through the discussions and conversations that we had through Adam on access. So that was one of the first key early wins of the collective of Adam. So we've talked, I've talked a little bit about the countries, but when we talk about the countries, as I mentioned, what we really want to do is that we've all agreed that we want to focus on a group of countries where the burden is highest and where there are limited access activities available currently. So we have we have decided to focus on the group of countries that are low and low and middle income as defined by the World Bank. At this point, there are over 80 LLMICs um, classified by the World Bank. But in order to begin the work of Adam, we've done an extensive analysis of those countries, looking at a whole range of criteria to determine which, which of those 80 are best placed right now to receive and use medicines. And based on that analysis, we have selected 46 target countries. I haven't included here the specific list of countries only because as we are still in the formative stages and beginning the initial outreach to those countries, we feel it's premature to actually distribute that um, more widely those lists because we want to begin those conversations right now. And also we don't want to create expectations um, too early because we intend to begin um, implementation um, mid to late next year, 2023. So we have 46 countries, but those 46 countries represent almost 3 billion population with more than 2.3 million premature cancer deaths that happened in 2020. So we have the target list of countries. We have an idea of the organizations that want to work on access, but now we needed to also determine which priority cancers we would want to focus on in the priority meds. So in order to do that, Another key piece of work that was done is that coalition also convened an expert advisory group to help us determine which are those priority cancers and meds. And that expert advisory group includes experts that currently are advising WHO and the medicines patent pool on selection of meds. So we've determined that we want to focus on six priority cancers, which pose the highest burden in low and lower middle income countries. Those are breast, lung, colorectal, prostate, cervical to some extent, although that's more technology focused and childhood cancers. Now, in terms of the childhood cancers, the strategy for Adam, we aim to work closely collaborating and aligning with WHO and the childhood cancer initiative that's currently being established to be able to leverage that work, work with them to see how we can look at doing single registration for the adult, for the medicines focused on the adult cancers. As we know, approximately 80% of medicines, essential medicines for pediatric cancer also are essential medicines for adult cancers, but we need to do the registration for them appropriately. We also want to work with WHO and leverage that work that they're doing in country to actually expand and amplify and collaborate with them. Primarily, what we want to do is at first potentially focus first on breast cancers and those adjuvant therapies and then expand to other medicines following the EML. And then as, as I've noted, we want to work with our pharma partners to be able to extend their channels to increase right now access to the medicines that they have in their portfolio that are on the EML. So for right now, aside from the priority cancers, we've also determined the priority list of generic medicines that we want to focus on, which are about 17. And along with that, we're now working with the advisory group to select the patented meds that we would also like to negotiate with our pharma partners. In terms of governance, the idea behind Adam is not to create another vertical organization, but yet have a vibrant coalition that is led and overseen by the members themselves. UICC 
will serve as the secretariat, but we will have an executive committee of organizations that are currently implementing access program, but also some key observers to the executive committee, which is the Medicines Patent Pool, the Access to Medicine Foundation, and hopefully the WHO as observers. Organizations that are CSOs that are currently implementing access program will be part of the governance through the coalition council. We will also have a private sector council for our industry partners to provide feedback and input on the strategy and the technical assistance that we want to, that we want to implement over time. As we begin the coordination and capacity building in country. Country coordination groups will also be established. And as those coordination groups are being established, representatives from those countries will also form part of the coalition council. So our intent is that over time, the governance of the coalition will not just be organizations based in Europe and North America, but also will be equitable to ensure that we have key local stakeholders and champions in those countries also participating in the governance. In order to ensure that we have specific guidance on technical aspects aspects related to access. We will also convene several expert advisory groups. As I've mentioned, the medicines advisory group has already been convened and are working. We just recently convened the diagnostics advisory groups and others will be also established along the way to focus focus on specific aspects of access. For example, procurement, supply chain, monitoring and evaluation. So in terms of the operating model, this slide is very dense, so I'm not going to go over it. But just to give you a, a quick summary, you know, the idea, as I mentioned, is that when we begin capacity building in countries, we will work first to convene those country coordination groups to do a country level analysis. They will do a needs assessment to see where we need to prioritize capacity building activities and begin implementation and financial support to organizations to do the capacity building work. Along with that, we will work with the relevant government uh, authorities to be able to sign MOUs and also provide support as part of the capacity building offer of recommendations on innovative health financing. So we can um, help countries to ensure sustainability supply over time. So what's next? We have recently started, we are still in the formative stages of Adam. We are now doing additional foundational research to determine the scope of current capacity building programs, particularly in some key countries where we've already identified that we would like to start capacity building as of next year. We're also working with our biopharma and generic partners to be able to get how we begin access to those meds specifically. We will also continue working with WHO to assess the potential of developing the single registration process across ADAM countries. And we are also beginning the soft outreach to our target country stakeholders, particularly those countries that have been really identified to begin the capacity building. At this point, we've been able to raise some funding to be able to actually launch the coalition, establish the secretariat and do some of this foundational research. But we're also in parallel doing a lot of fundraising. You know, We have some money to begin capacity building, but we are confident that we will be able to raise enough funds to really take this at scale and begin to move forward as of mid-2020. In terms of the coalition, there is a lot of pieces to this puzzle. Coalition's aims are very ambitious, but given the enormity of the problem, we believe that a new model is needed to be able to address the access issue. And the only model that we or that we feel can really be able to have an impact is if we coalesce that we have there is power in the collective and we hope that as we move forward we will be able to really have an impact and save more lives particularly for those countries that have the greatest burden in terms of cancer care and control if anyone would like more information on adam i'm happy to provide that um, and to give you more detail on how you may be coming involved and give you more information on the specific meds or the countries that we intend to work uh, with together. So thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa, for that uh, comprehensive talk. Again, I'm sure there'll be questions for you shortly. Now, I'd like to revert back to uh, Dr. Audrey Bowie, um, Cancer Control Officer at the WHO. And Suzanne is going to show your slides. Andre, please introduce yourself just so we can check we can hear you okay. Indeed, indeed. I'm sorry. So greetings, everyone. I'm so sorry for the difficulties and really thank you to PSYOP, to World Child Cancer, to many of you who we've come to know as dear friends of GICC over these years. In the next 10 minutes, I'll focus now on the platform. Many of you have heard a bit of the platform, what we're hoping to achieve. Our objective here is just to bring you further in. We are talking about a transformative opportunity that builds on the momentum behind the global initiative, a home for all of us to drive forward this issue of access to childhood cancer medicines. Next slide, please, Suzanne. It starts with a simple vision. 
many of us that have been working in GICC countries, and it was really wonderful to hear the experience from Zimbabwe as a reference. It has helped. We see momentum improving and access to care for children with cancer. But we know that childhood cancer medicines remains a primary bottleneck to achieve the survival target that we have all oriented ourselves around. So what is the ambition? The ambition of the platform is now to help address this issue of access to childhood cancer medicines, to ensure that every child living around the world with cancer has access to quality assured products to help save their lives. I just want to pause because what we're also talking about here is a massive commitment. If you can see and appreciate that St. Jude Children's Research Hospital has offered to kickstart this platform with a $200 million commitment, $200 million. This is an opportunity for all of us. This is an opportunity to change the landscape of childhood cancer medicines and even more broadly access to care for all that are diagnosed with cancer. So thank you to them. Thank you also to many of you, the organizations that have been supporting GICC. We have over 100 partners helping implement GICC in 70 countries. So together we will be able to advance the agenda. This is about all of us, multi-sectoral collaboration, St. Jude Global, other UN agencies, SIOP and CCI, each of you are important partners. You can see the timeline here of what we've been working to achieve and what has led up. But fundamentally, we have spent two years understanding every possible opportunity, risk, and challenge that we will encounter with the platform. And we are confident now that together we can move forward and achieve the goal of increasing access to care. So how will we do this? As you've heard from Daniel, from others, from Gilles and Melissa, the access to cancer medicine problem is complex. It is not one bottleneck, but multiple bottlenecks along the life cycle of the medicine or the value chain. To just share with you some of the highlights for what we've been able to discover in the past two years, better understanding what happens when we set the goal of getting a medicine to a child who needs it. Well, in childhood cancer, there are multiple failures. Fundamentally, it's because governments aren't purchasing medicines for children. What we often find are facilities or NGOs like Daniel's are the ones that are often purchasing the medicines. And as a result, there's no quality assurance. There's no appropriate quantification. We see stockouts, we see concerns with forfeit, counterfeit medicines as we've seen in the Q&A. And also we see unfortunate outcomes such as the children with cancer and their families paying seven times more than a high income country would pay for the same medicine and have no assurance that that medicine is of appropriate quality. We also know that the entire fragmentation of the market has resulted in substandard and often inappropriate medicines being procured at the facility level. We see that governments aren't ready to pay for childhood cancer medicines because they either see the problem as something outside of their interest or outside of their scope. And here again, we have a unique opportunity. Next slide. So what are we going to do within this platform? Many of you have heard that this is about a broad collaboration across all stakeholders in childhood cancer. There will be a core steering committee, but there will also be an opportunity for all stakeholders to engage, whether it's the private sector, whether it's philanthropic foundations, whether it's other civil society actors, and of course, professional societies like SIOP. Within that broader architecture of the governance, and we're happy to go through it in detail, but just again, to reassure each of you that as we now progress towards the launch, this governance structure will become much more personal as we reach out to each of you and better, better understand how can you fit within the platform and what types of opportunities do you see in your country, in the region to improve access to childhood cancer care. One of the foundational elements that we bring is not only the major investment that St. Jude has offered here to kickstart the platform, but also the recognition that because there will be likely a procurement agency that is through the UN system, we will be able to assure the quality of the medicines. We'll be able to address importation issues. We'll be able to address the registration issues that you heard from Melissa. We'll be able to monitor the supply chain. And these are fundamentally the reasons we are optimistic that this will succeed. It will be at least a five-year commitment. And you can see the scope of the commitment that St. Jude, WHO, and others are making here. The objective is as many as 120,000 children or more will benefit from the platform in the first five years. That represents between 30 and 60% of all children living with cancer in low and or lower middle income countries. To succeed, we have to take it in phases. The first is the development phase. 
Again, now having spent the past year organizing the initiative, the governance, the legal agreements that need to happen, and of course, the personnel. We were benefiting from some of the greatest expertise that exists in the world to ensure that each step in the platform will be successful, from procurement and supply chain to last mile delivery. Within the next year, we'll focus more on getting the medicine into countries, launching the initiative, ensuring that children are appropriately receiving the care that they need, and of course, looking at the broader system that will empower that success, the diagnostics, the workforce, and the capacity building. And then from 2024 to 2027, we'll expand to 50 countries, the objective of, again, of serving over 100,000 children with cancer. What's unique about this platform is that it is full end-to-end -end support, and we are building on existing capacities to ensure that's the case. We're already looking at what's in the pipeline. How can we better understand the products that are being developed in childhood cancer and ensure, as we've heard from Gilles, that those products are available and on a national or on the WHO essential medicine list. The formulations are friendly. We're discussing this already with pharmaceutical companies and larger networks like GAPA. We will use pre-qualification, as you heard from Melissa. There are often problems with registration and the regulatory environment around products. WHO pre-qualification can help facilitate that process. That is an instrument that we already have for medicines that talks a map, and we will expand it as part of the platform. We will also align the EDL, as we heard so well from Gilles, that both the email and the essential diagnostic list will need routine updates that will be facilitated through the platform. We're developing a forecasting tool because stockouts we know happen all around the world. This will allow for us to better quantify the needs and to develop rapid response mechanisms because if a stockout still happens, we know the medicine needs to get to the children in time. Third, we're gonna offer a catalog for services beyond just the medicine. We've seen already questions about supportive care medicines. Those are within the scope of the platform in, in order to directly or through a broader mechanism support the hospitals and the families that are trying to access these essential medicines. We're working very intensively on diagnostics, ensuring that the diagnostics that are needed for childhood cancer will be available, and we have some emerging opportunities here that will also help transform the environment. We're working with uh, partners to better understand kits so that we can offer through the platform mechanisms by which safe handling of chemotherapy can be enabled, gloves, masks, laminar hoods, et cetera. We're updating guidance to ensure proper prescribing, and we're also dealing with the issue of the safe handling and disposal of chemotherapy. But all of this will also require strengthening data systems, both health information systems and logistical systems, because in every regard, we will be able to track what medicine is getting to which child, when, and, what for, and for what indication. And that assurance will also provide us the benefit of knowing that they are receiving the best possible care. So what is the potential? We don't need to go through this, and I'm sorry again for the technological difficulties. I'm happy to take some questions and also from colleagues that are online from St. Jude. The potentials are huge. Before we launched this platform, we did an analysis of every procurement-based partnership within cancer and beyond cancer, from the global fund to stop TV to understand what predicts success. We are at a unique moment in time. We are seeing our new horizon that will offer us an opportunity to improve care for every child with cancer around the world. We are finalizing the development phase. Many of you are wondering, as we've heard already, which countries. This information, we will also make sure we continue to communicate within the channels that exist. And please do reach out if you have any questions or comments about this. We're finalizing the staff, the highest level professional staff that are needed for this platform to succeed, and also the procurement agency that will guarantee its success. Where are we going? By Q1 or Q2 next year, we hope to do a more formal launch for the platform in which all medicines will be cataloged, the other associated support care medicines and diagnostics will also be referenced. We have a mechanism to engage partners across sectors and also to ensure that all medicines can be tracked to address the concerns that we've seen in the Q&A. So just this, I know many of you, we sat around a table together in 2017 as we first talked about the global initiative and its possibility. In 2018, we launched it with 100 stakeholders at the table, all believing that we have a better tomorrow at our hand. It has been, it's been four years and now we have 70 governments that are interested in childhood cancer because of each of you. We feel excited about this next step. It is again a new frontier and we never thought that we would be able to see it within such a short period after the initiative. Thank you really to St. Jude because this is a unique opportunity for all of us. 
It is indeed all of us. We know that, and each of you, please, we hope that you feel close. This platform is part of SIOP, part of CCI, and part of each of your organizations, because in many regards, all of us will be touched by it. Thank you to SIOP, to World Child Cancer, and to each of you as our partners for bringing us together. And we look forward to moving forward in a very definitive way in the upcoming months and years ahead. Thanks. Thank you so much, Andre, for this presentation. It was really worth waiting for, <laughs> for being able to, to listen to it. We, it. It's totally exciting. And, you know, I'm sure you will, you will have many questions later on. Um, you know, while we wait for the, uh, you know, certainly revolutionary impact of, of this initiative and also initiatives such as Atom, um, um, you know, as, as Daniel has already uh, very nicely il illustrated like at the beginning of this, there are a number of organizations that are uh, currently right now working to do their best in order to um, to be able to to bring high quality medicines uh, in, uh, in in low and middle income countries. At World Child Cancer, we've been uh, very very lucky to be able to establish a partnership with international health partners. Now, um, Adele Patterson, the CEO of the organization, will tell uh, you more about this this partnership and, and and the organization. To you, Adele, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I'm trusting that everything you can see that you need to see in front of you here. Um, so as mentioned, I'm Adele Patterson and I'm from International Health Partners. And I'm here to speak today about the way that International Health Partners plays a role in bridging the gap so that people across the world can access the medicines that they need. Um, which is hoping you can get the next so International Health Partners uh, works to provide access to quality, needed, long dated medicines and healthcare products. And we work in disaster hit and vulnerable communities. In practice, this means that we match demand and supply with a needs led approach. We carry out due diligence and compliance on donor companies and receiving organisations in line with our WDA licence. We perform the consolidation of goods, we arrange logistics and transportation, and we also deliver evaluation and impact measurement. And in practice, that means that we connect healthcare companies to qualified medical NGOs who receive medicines that are long dated and needed in a variety of different forms, including uh, essential health packs, which are a pre-packaged assortment of medications that are easily transportable or with dating that is over 18 months that is um, appropriate for a range of different healthcare situations. We are also able to support um, approved medical partners in disasters um, and also support longer term health programming. And since 2021, we have been working very hard as has everybody else um, in this space. And we have delivered uh, nearly 25 million treatments of long dated needed medicines to around 16 partners working in 33 countries. And of course, we don't just work in the children's cancer space, but we're also working in disaster response, mental health programming, maternal and child health, neglected diseases. And with our partnership with World Child Cancer, we are now working in pediatric oncology. So just a little bit of a sense there of how we work and what we do. Um, as I mentioned, we work with about 16 partners uh, across a range of therapy areas. And when we're looking for partners to work with, we have to look for organisations that have organisational strength to support the due diligence requirements that we have as an organisation. Um, as an organisation that has a WDA, uh, that's a wholesale dealers authorisation, we're regulated by the UK's Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Authority. We have stringent good distribution practice requirements and knowledge of patient safety that we expect our partners to be able to match as well. We need to make sure that the areas that we can match in terms of the company support that we can provide, that that matches the strategic therapy areas uh, that we can access uh, with healthcare priorities and we also need to make sure that we have the capacity to support organizations as well. 
And of course, as you'd expect, World Child Cancer was able to meet these requirements that we have as an organisation. We started working with World Child Cancer um, a couple of years ago. And once World Child Cancer had completed our due diligence requirements, we reached out to our network of corporate partners um, in line with the needs that the organisation had for support. We decided that we wanted to work firstly as a pilot programme to support World Child Cancer as they supported 300 children in Malawi. So we reached out to a range of our long-term supporters who were able to match the needs that were identified. And we were delighted that one of our corporate partners, Accord, was very, very keen to support the programme. And not only were they keen to support the programme, but they wanted to support it for the long term. We have operated for nearly 20 years um, in this space, delivering um, healthcare product. And the way that we like to work ideally is for companies to produce, to donate. So this for us is the gold standard in terms of gifts in kind donation. So we identify companies that have the appropriate therapy areas to support and they produce to donate, which means that um, receiving organisations get the medicines that they want, but they're also very long dated and obviously part of the regulated supply chain. Uh, Accord are long term supporters of IHP. And not only were they wanting to support uh, for this particular programme, but also planning to donate for the longer term as well. And after the initial pilot that we've run with World Child Cancer in Malawi, we're really delighted that the support uh, and the, the programmatic um, sort of matching has worked so well that Accord as a corporate partner want to grow this programme um, to increase the amount of support uh, that they are able to give through IHP to this work and are looking to grow the programme from Malawi into Cameroon and possibly looking at Ghana. And we've not always also We've also been able to engage with another corporate donor um, who's going to be supporting the work that we've already started in Malawi with some supply chain, with some cold chain product as well in Malawi. So as we think about the way that these sorts of programmes work, we recognise that many of us are working in different spaces here. Um, I think one of the great things about the way that IHP was able to work with World Child Cancer is that we are strongly based on the needs of the NGO partner in country. And we just work to connect the two parts of, of the process. So that's the manufacturers that want to donate with approved partners who are delivering quality health care at the end. The capabilities that we focus on are uh, identifying needs. So we only ever, as an organisation, deliver the medicines and healthcare products that our NGO partners are asking for. And once we have a happy pharmacist, I think we know that we've done a good job. Uh, we are very keen to make sure that and educate the doning, donating companies uh, that uh, it's the in-country partners that know exactly what they want. So we only ever uh, supply what people have asked for. But all of this is underpinned by a very strong quality management system. So everybody within our organisation is GDP compliant. So that's good distribution compliance. And we work very, very hard to make sure that we retain our licence because that's one of the unique elements that we're able to provide as a support agency, but we were also uh, experts at delivering healthcare into a range of different environments. Uh, so our logistics team are very good at making sure that the right product gets to the right place at the right time. So we're delighted to be working with World Child Cancer. Uh, we know that this is just one part of, of the work that World Child Cancer is doing, and we look forward to growing the project and the support that we're able to deliver through the bridging and the partnership model that we run. Um, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions um, at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adele. Um, I can confirm that, you know, it's, um, um, it's a very happy partnership. The expertise uh, of your team, Adele, is, is really incredible. It makes it look like this very, very complicated thing, such as sending drugs uh, into difficult environment, uh, quite, quite an easy one. So thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. George Chakaluka, which is um, head of the pediatric oncology uh, department at uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Blantyre, Malawi. He'll be talking a little bit about um, he, the, the impact that the, the partnership we had with the international partner had and other consideration around uh, access to cancer medicine in, uh, in Malawi. Thank you, George. So I think 
uh, the, the statements that I'm going to share here have been shared uh, before by my, my, present, my, my fellow presenters. And I have to say uh, that uh, in Malawi, we've got two centers, and these two centers uh, are seeing about 600 new cases annually. Uh, that means 300 uh, cases in each center. Having said that, 40% of these cases uh, remain uh, undiagnosed. And the, the WHO Global Initiatives aims to increase survival to at least 60% by the year 2030. But most of the uh, cases that we see are common and curable cancers, uh, the commonest being Beckett's lymphoma, uh, followed by acute lymph lymphoblastic uh, leukemia. Uh, we see very few cases of brain tumors. The challenges are many uh, that impact on survival. Uh, that includes abandonment to treatment, late presentation, late diagnosis, and poor access to essential medicine. And uh, poor access uh, to essential medicine requires so many hands on the deck. Now, when we talk of access to essential medicine, we're not looking at quantity. We're also looking at whether the drug is available. We're also looking at whether the drug is affordable and whether the, we, we have a, a good quality uh, drug. And this is a, an important uh, a step uh, uh, that uh, for improving cancer outcomes uh, in in low and middle income countries, and evidence right now suggests that uh, access is, is variable across countries. Some countries have got excess of essential medicine; others have got no access at all. In Malawi, for example, we see we get about ten percent of the essential medicine that are provided by, by the government, so which leaves us with a gap of 90%, uh, which we either have to source or to get as donations from our partners. Now, why do we have poor access to essential medicines in Malawi? Number one, I think uh, there is also a, an issue of politicization of central medical stores. Central medical stores is a border that is mandated to procure uh, distribute as well as store uh, drugs. But oftentimes, the people that are ordered tenders to supply medicine to the central uh, medical stores have got political connections. And uh, of late, we have got, we have had lack of uh, forex uh, in the country. Not only forex for medicine, but forex for fuel as well. Now, how do we improve access to essential uh, medicine in low and middle income countries? I think we can borrow a, a leaf from the HIV uh, program. When ARTs were, uh, were starting, uh, the prices were very high. But right now, the, the prices of ARTs uh, are almost on the bottom uh, because of uh, overproduction. Uh, and that has lowered the prices. We also need to update and revise our essential medicine list. Uh, we heard it uh, earlier on from the uh, WHO. But we also need to improve and streamline procurement uh, uh, bottlenecks uh, that are, are there in our countries. And uh, above all, we need political com commitment, but also must take hold approach uh, to the problem. Now, we couldn't uh, hold our hands and uh, watch the fire burning so WCC, uh, uh, with the help of WCC, we we uh, we had we signed an agreement with International Health Partnerty uh, Partners, and we appreciate uh, for that agreement. And through that agreement, we've managed to they have managed to successfully uh, deliver. Uh, at least two uh, consignments uh, of medicine. And these are not just uh, uh, medicine, but they have got high quality uh, medicine. We see it when we're treating our patients. Our patients become more neutropenic with the medicine that we get. So we can essentially assess quality of the medicine. But also uh, the WCC also uh, provide, provides us with uh, budgetary support which has been very handy uh, in, 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 in times of need. So 
this is because of the partnership uh, with IHP. Now the, our fridges uh, are with are full of medicine. Uh, not that uh, we have excess, but I think we we are better off now than we were uh, a year ago. So in conclusion, I think we know that there are barriers uh, to, to access uh, essential uh, cancer medicine in, in, in our countries. So barriers include disruption in the supply chain, barriers in, in terms of uh, uh, pay or having finances to pay for this medicine, and therefore, I think having uh, uh, partners can, that can help and can work together can help to uh, sort this problem. And, therefore, and, and in the end, we have improved survival uh, in, in, in uh, pediatric cancer. Thank you. Thank you, George. Very clear presentation. And what a pleasure to see your well-stocked fridge. But as you say, that's just one part of the uh, solution. Uh, but some very interesting comments you made there. I'd now like to move on and introduce our final um, speaker, uh, Dr. Liliana Vasquez, who is the immediate past president of the Latin American Pediatric Oncology, uh, SIOP LATAM and a consultant for the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer at the PAHO, Pan-American Health Organization, and she's based in Peru. So over to you, Liliana. Thank you so much, Cathy, and thank you. Thanks to SIOP and the World Child Cancer for this kind invitation to this webinar during the London Cancer Week. So I will share my screen. Let me know if you can see my slides. And I would like to uh, start this presentation just giving an overview of the topic of essential medications for children with cancer in a region in Latin America and the Caribbean, and some um, experiences that we're having in several countries. So first, uh, to comment that in Latin America is definitely one of the one of the most unequal regions in the world. We see that the survival among countries in in our region is very variable. We have countries in which childhood cancer has an estimated survival of 30% or even less. Mm -hmm. We have countries in which the survival could be as high as Canada or high income countries from 80 to 85% of overall survival. And this is also to reflect and how the access to timely and quality drugs for childhood cancer reveals an important um, uh, factor for this. Mm -hmm. I would like to highlight some experiences and some important research uh, studies that have been published in, in the region during the last years or decades about this topic and particularly some uh, relevant documents from Colombia, for example, from Brazil, also from Peru, from several countries in the region, visibilizing the problem, the access of essential medications, the so shortage of drugs for the children with cancer, and different types of problems that we have. And Andre has mentioned this previously in all the process of the distribution, procurement, and finally the the, the distribution and, and the, the the children with cancer as an user at the end. So this is something that uh, is important for us, how to explain this uh, type of issues in the countries. And also some relevant uh, papers that have been published, particularly in Brazil, about the quality of drugs, about how the quality of very important drugs, uh, such as LA asparaginase, for example, could affect the outcome, could affect the prognosis of these children with cancer, revealing different results, specifically in, in important types of cancer, such as leukemia. And also as SLAO, so as the Latin American branch of SIO, we have a very interesting paper that was published two years ago about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and several types of 
services, pediatric oncology services, and including also medication, including the access of drugs for children with cancer. And I would like to, to, to show here that up to 50% of the countries reveal that they had at least 30% of partial or total uh, alteration of the uh, in modification of the chemotherapy due to a lack of drugs. And this is important for us, of course, because we all know that the pandemic was a uh, very difficult um, era for all of us, but the outcome and the results of this, how this will impact on the, on the, on the results of these children, we still is largely unknown. And also some data that we have from the childhood cancer profiles that Bajo published last year about essential medicines. And let me show you that up to 67% of the WHO essential medicines to treat children with cancer are included in the essential medicines list of the countries. That means that we need to do better on including uh, the essential medicines uh, uh, as described by WHO and following the essential medicines list into the national or sub-regional essential medicine slates of the country. And this is highly variable as well. We see that, for example, in South America, in Central America and Mexico, the percentage of the of this the, of the inclusion of these essential drugs in the national uh, medicine list uh, is as high as 72 or 73 percent. But in the Caribbean countries, for example, it could drop up to uh, 46%. So uh, there's a large disparity in our countries. And to mention that, of course, the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer has prioritized this uh, as a topic, as a core project, the essential medicines and technologies, uh, including in our region to, uh, to promote the use of uh, a resource that we have as BAHO, as a strategic fund that I will mention in the following minutes. And as part of the work of the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer, I would like to mention that now, so far, we are working with 15 countries uh, that in which the Ministry of Health have agreed to work with BAHO, with St. Jude, in this joint initiative to achieve the 60% of the survival globally. Uh, but every country is very different. Some of the countries have a prioritization on childhood cancer registries, on um, guidelines uh, and national standards. And some of them are including, I think more now, more than ever, including the uh, some strategies to improve the access of essential medicines. But there's a lot that we uh, need to do, still need to do about that topic. And also just, also, of course, to mention, because this is probably uh, uh, the largest um, and most important effort on improving the survival of these children. And Andre has uh, explained it very well, how this effort of bringing uh, this uh, global uh, platform for access on childhood cancer medicines, including the six regions, the six WHO regions, with a clear vision, with a clear strategy, I think it will be, make, make a really important difference for, for our patients. I have mentioned also that as PAHO, as, as, as a regional um, organization, also we are working through the, uh, the support of the PAHO Strategic Fund, which is a, a resource that we have that is, has been created to support the member states in every single aspect of the process, as it has been described, the basically the estimation, the distribution, the uh, to support some technical problems in the manufacturing and facilitate the dialogue with the um, the procurement agencies and to try to improve this access. The strategic plan has been working in several countries and mostly on other topics, not specifically cancer. I think there's mm -hmm. more countries that are working in HIV drugs and uh, malaria, for example, or other communicable diseases um, in the region, but I, uh, for cancer medicines, it's getting better. And I think 
some of the work that we're doing is trying to promote and uh, to include the strategic fund as a stakeholder, uh, including also this for these global platforms uh, uh, between St. Jude and WHO. So my final messages will be that the access to essential medicines to childhood cancer is a significant problem in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have several reports, even personal communications from several countries, which have, well, we can talk about that in the discussion with several types of problems. And it's very important to explore the causes of these, uh, these issues. And that for, for all of us, I think at the global level, this SEDJUD and WHO platform represents an important effort and a hope that this could help us to overcome these disparities. And the Bajo Strategic Plan it will be, I think it, it will be a good um, ally and, and, and will uh, represent a regional resource to assure this uh, uh, DS access uh, timely and with quality. And also to mention that the, there is more work need more work needed in, into this collaboration interregionally with Latin America and other regions to identify these global trends and how we can measure the impact of these efforts. Thank you so much. So thank you, Liliana. Very um, exciting what you're doing in the Pajo region. So we have 30, just over 30 minutes left for a discussion and for the panelists to answer some of the questions that you've put in the Q&A panel that haven't yet been answered in writing. And then if there's time, I'll come back to some of the ones where there have been written answers sent, but you may wish to hear them discussed further. But first of all, I would like to invite uh, Professor Guillermo Chantada, who is the SIOP president, um, who himself is from Argentina, Uruguay, but also has the foot in Spain now in Barcelona, to give us his reflections on, on what he's heard from these seven excellent speakers. Um, and, and then we'll move into the discussion with the panel. Thank you very much, Cathy. It's my pleasure to uh, share with you this, uh, this panel. I am impressed with the presentations, I think they were really, really excellent. Uh, I have a few notes uh, and a, a lot of notes and a lot of uh, take home messages. One thing that uh, I, I think it changed in the past few years, and I think it's a, a side effect of the global initiative is the sense of urgency, right? I see I see now this sense of urgency. We need, we, we are close to change, close to, Fill this gap, uh, which maybe was also influenced by by the by the pandemic, right? That uh, it, it it looks like uh, we are now uh, forced to do something and and to change the situation. And I think this, this was very uh, effectively communicated by by all the speakers. We had speakers from different backgrounds, different continents, organizations. Uh, NGOs, uh, really uh, the World Health Organization, the PAHO. So I think uh, that variation, that uh, singularity of the presentations, I think, was was really uh, essential. I take uh, one of the, the the comments that was um, raised. I, I think it, it was from from Daniel that. Uh, this um, the tackling with the um, full provision of uh, essential medicines is um, necessary, but probably not sufficient. We still need to um, work on other issues that uh, that also um, influence the survival, like uh, treatment abandonment, like like uh, Dr. George mentioned from from Malawi, and. Uh, there also, uh, I think um, that's a personal perspective. I think uh, some some of that was was mentioned by by George and Daniel, but uh, political also the the volat um, like uh, the political um, situation that is not so stable in in many countries uh, that uh, it is volatile, and that is also something that might influence. We saw examples in some countries of great programs that were really improving a lot and then the next government changed and they didn't uh, continue because the other government was the one that was doing that so it's difficult also 
I think that also Melissa mentioned that that involving the um, the governments because otherwise it is not possible. But on the other hand, sometimes uh, this is also uh, a, a risky um, situation. So uh, I really think um, we are um, in in a great time. I think all the speakers mentioned that 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 this is a, an outstanding moment. Uh, childhood cancer is on the spotlight. We can make uh, changes. I think our generation will witness this these changes, these dramatic changes in countries in the world where we will go from zero to ten percent to maybe sixty percent in in a decade. And uh, and I think uh, that is uh, what I like of this uh, of this very diverse speakers list. And that is what I learned today for bringing uh, home. We uh, have this urgency. We will make this. We will make this happen. We have uh, all the stakeholders uh, pushing for the same um, objective, and a lot of tools right now. And uh, so, I'd like to open for for the discussion. I think there were a few questions, uh, Kathy. Would you like to comment them, or I have some list. Uh, I, I took some notes, but if you want, uh, please go ahead. Yes, I'm happy to ask uh, on behalf of the pr people that wrote the questions um, and direct them to the appropriate speakers. So I'm going to take them in the order in that they appeared. Uh, Dr. Hamoud Hodesh Al Husseini has asked two questions. The first is for Daniel, I think, in Zimbabwe. How has the shortage of drugs affected survival in Zimbabwe? Are you able to comment on that very challenging question, Daniel? Yes, uh, thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Doctor, for that question. Um, I mean, it, it's 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 difficult for me to you know to give you the stats per se, but I think in in general, you know, just lack of something you know will always have an, an effect. Um, but I think in, with us in Zimbabwe, it's not just about you know the lack of drugs, but like someone said, also you know we're not too sure in terms of the quality of the drugs that we're getting. And then, and then there are other uh, factors that are affecting the survival rate. And, and in, in Zimbabwe, for example, it's, it's late presentations. You know, so no, no matter how hard we work, that is something that we still need to work on just to make sure that, you know, we get children to present early just so that we can give our clinicians, you know, a better chance to actually treat them and also increase our survival rates. So it's not just the drugs, but I think in our setting as well, we need to work on our awareness as well. Thank you. And the same uh, Dr. Al Husseini had a question I think I'd ask Gilles to take on first, commenting on the difference in the kind of breadth and scope of the essential medicines list in Europe uh, compared to many low middle income countries. And how does that, you know, does that explain quite a lot of difference in survival rate? But Gilles, maybe you could comment on you know, your list came from a different source of actually treatment protocols in use. But, you know, what does that mean for LMICs and their own essential medicines list? So thank you, Kenti. To answer this question, the work we did was to look at what standard treatments are delivered in Europe to children, what drugs are there and considered as essential, and really to be sure that all children in Europe can have access to this. And we already saw there are some issues. But as mentioned by uh, um, the person who asked the question, out of the 66 medicine considered essential for treating these patients, only one third is on the WHO list of 2017. And this is normal at the moment because for example, on the WHO list, neuroblastoma is not mentioned. Brain tumors are not mentioned. And now there is low grade glioma, which is one of the six diseases which is now mentioned. We are not, uh, 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 the drugs needed for uh, uh, allogenic stem cell transplantation are not mentioned as well. So clearly those treatments need much more than only essential medicine. There's a real need for I mean, the capability of diagnosis, of delivering, to be sure that patient can be safely treated in this setting. So one, one of the questions was, well, it shows the gap but also the progress that can be made. And clearly we have now published with a monography for each of the medicine, the evidence 
that these medicines are important for the treatment. And this is a tool that can be used. And this is why we are planning to, uh, again, propose contribution to the uh, WHO essential medicine list to continue to provide in this list what will really be essential for children across the planet. There is way forward, but we believe it, it might be relevant and we hope it will. Thank did you. Did I answer you. the question, Cathy? You did, thank okay. you. And, and I wanted to draw the audience's attention to a, a follow-up question from Dr. Makamo that was answered um, by Andre Elbaoui, which is the question was, what are the reasons that governments are not adding drugs on the WHO EML to their national EMLs? And how can this be addressed? Uh, and Andre, perhaps you could just expand on that answer um, for your uh, for this audience, and then maybe Melissa would like to answer too. Thanks, Kathy, and really thanks to the audience for some very important and provocative questions that are being put in the Q and A. So, what we have been spending time to understand is the question that you asked. This very important question of why aren't more products being included in the national central medicine list? What we just want to briefly reference is that there are multiple areas of coherency that we need to achieve. So one is, does the national EML align with the WHO EML? The next is, does the national EML align with what the government pays for or what's called the benefit package? The next is, is that same medicine also included in clinical treatment guidelines? And then of course, the last is, is that product available at the clinical level? When we look across that landscape, there is very little coherence. So it may be on the national EML, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the government will purchase it. The government may say they're gonna purchase it, but they're not necessarily purchasing enough. It may be on the clinical practice guidelines, but the providers aren't necessarily following it. So what we're really trying to focus on here is greater coherency in how governments develop policies and also how practices are shaped by the, those government policies. One of the values of the platform is that when we have these discussions with governments, we do it by bringing all stakeholders at the table. So we've done this in certain countries where we've already provided medicines through WHO mechanisms or working through partners like St. Jude in countries like Yemen, Libya, um, Syria, and a few others. What we do is we say, let's start and ask, what are the essential medicines you need? Much in line with what Gila said. Does that in fact align also with the WHO EML? All the way downstream to what are your clinical practice guidelines? And then using that and instance-based data to better understand how much of those products are needed. I see another important question on stockouts and uh, shortages, which perhaps we can take on uh, another point. But one of the values of doing this exercise to promote cohesion is because if in fact we have those strategic discussions at the beginning of a policy dialogue on access to cancer medicines, we can get all those dimensions lined up. So it's not just it's on the national essential medicines list, but it also means it's paid for, it's available, and it has sufficient quality to be available for good care for the child with cancer. Thank you. M Melissa, did you wish to add anything? No, just to number one, agree with Andre, because number one, even if a medicine is listed on an EML, a national EML, doesn't necessarily mean that it exists. But also to take it a step further, you know, when we, as Adam started to do the research and look into the availability, current availability of medicines as listed on national EMLs, looking at the research that had been recently published about the availability, when you look at the lists, right, the average, I think the average uh, date of submission that they looked at, right, that we looked at, I mean, that had submitted to WHO was like 2011, right? So a lot of those EML lists at the national level aren't necessarily updated, you know, updated regularly. So we looked at that data more like proxy, right? And it tells you a lot of things. And just as Andre said, it's, it's you know, it's not only the availability, but the government prioritization of purchasing meds, right, isn't necessarily there. And one of the things that we do would like to do along with our partners, including WHO, is really to shine a light on how important it is to look at doing the analysis of national EMLs, how important it is to really have that availability um, and make sure that the medicines that are on those EMLs are actually there, right, that they can forecast and purchase in a sustainable way. Thank you. Then we have another topic area, which started out with a question from Eric Sandler about how we can assure the quality of medicines. But I also 
Senator George in Malawi made a comment that with his new supply of drugs through IHP, it seems to be causing more neutropenia. There may be more, you know, a biological effect there. And I think a few others have commented, uh, Liliana did, about asparaginase and, and so on. So who would like to uh, take that question first about how we can assure the quality of the drugs that are being supplied? Andrew. Andre, do you want to go first? Thanks, Kathy. No, I, I don't want to take too much, so please, I'll, I'll try to make it brief. But it, it is important that when one of the downsides of a facility-based purchasing scheme is often the tender is done in a way that we don't have regulatory oversight as to which manufacturer or which supplier is ultimately accountable if there are any concerns about quality. There is no mechanism by which we can track here is the initial manufacturer and what happened downstream. So in this architecture, and I think uh, Guillermo brings up a very important point on what is the government role, what is the political will that needs to be in place. Without the government having some contribution, the accountability mechanisms get lost. So within the platform, the only manufacturers that will be contributing products into the platform are those that are either approved by stringent regulatory authorities. Those are those that exist in Europe, in the US, in Canada, in Japan, and other countries and those that are pre-qualified, which means WHO is either directly or used a mechanism to validate that the product itself is quality assured. So that's step one. Step two is in fact, a lot of the supply issues, a lot of the supply chain concerns exacerbate the quality, which is if you can't maintain a cold chain, then of course the product itself won't have the same active ingredients that will be compromised because of the supply chain issues. So it is important that when we look at the supply chain, that may also be a reason why some of the products are also of substandard uh, quality. The final dimension is reporting. And I think many of us in the community are very sensitive to what happened to asparaginase. There are mechanisms by which WHO will monitor with stakeholders in the community concerns about quality. So please, if anyone in the community has a concern about a product being substandard or falsified, please alert us so we can talk about what you can do. Because every provider, whether you're working in a public facility, a private facility or others, can trigger a surveillance alert on a product if you are concerned. So we're very happy to explain what that process looks like. But just to, again, to say that through the platform, we do feel increasingly confident because we will have better surveillance and also will ensure that only high quality manufacturers are contributing. If I may, thank you, you yeah. Who, who else um, would like to add? Yes, please go ahead, Liliana. No, I just wanted to add that I think that what Andrea was mentioning was very important. And also mentioning that the role of the academic societies is very important also to verify the quality of uh, the drugs, specifically pediatric cancer. We have seen that pediatric oncology is part of the multidisciplinary team are making important efforts to uh, conduct studies in a preclinical phase and trying to um, test the, uh, the, the quality, the toxicity, the effectivity of the drugs. Uh, it has started with acute leukemia, with the example of Arasparaginas in, in, in Brazil, but we see also in other countries in which the regulation is supporting uh, efforts in which uh, we should um, make these efforts into the, the to assure the quality of the drugs and in a pragmatic in a regulatory way. I think it's something that, as Andrea was mentioning, as a community, uh, we can be organized and to start to do these these efforts as, uh, as different factions of this and different stakeholders as well. But I I, I really like the the idea that. In several years, uh, we can have like this um, this organized efforts as countries as a sub region or as a region as well. So that we can uh, have uh, some specific guidelines and specific regulations for certain, at least for certain types of childhood cancer, including leukemia, for wounds tumor, for little gastoma, for example, as well. And how these could correlate, as I was mentioning, with the outcomes of, uh, of the children uh, with cancer. Uh, I've seen very impressive works that I think there will be also a paper from Colombia that will be published soon about how we can relate the um, uh, the, the effectivity of the drug uh, with certain type of different uh, brands of, of 
as paraginais, and how this could be related to the outcome of these children. So I guess it's it's a word that we all need to be involved at the end. That was my comments. Thank you. Um, now, before we come on to a key question about how Atom and the GCAP work together and interface, I'd like to add a question of my own, and maybe Adele could take this on. Um, I'm interested to know, many of the chemotherapy drugs used in pediatric oncology are used off-label. Is it a barrier to being able to supply them if they don't have a pediatric authorization for the use for which you're planning to import them into a country? And if, if it is a barrier, how do you work around it? Because it must go on. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd probably best to bounce that back to George, because what we always say is that it's our partners in country that make the decision around the medicines that they are requesting. Um, so, you know, we, we are managing that middle part of it. Um, and we're also liaising directly with the donating companies as well. So we obviously have to identify the need that's there. But, um, you know, off-label usage is something that Obviously, our donor companies are aware of, um, but I prefer for George, I think, to comment on that because he's using the medicines in country in a way that we're not. George, would you like to comment if you're available? Yes, uh, I think that's a <laughs> that's a very important uh, comment. I think for us, uh, the the only drug that probably that is for off level in kids is probably a toposide. But, you know, there, there are no restrictions uh, in, in terms of the regulatory authorities uh, in bringing the, the drug in the country. So, we, I mean, we accept the drug anyway and we use it. Uh, and uh, there are no, there, there are no um, uh, queries about it. Thank you, George. Gilles and then André have their hands up, followed by Guillermo. Yeah, thank you, Cathy. The vast majority of the off-label used have been explored over the last 50 years by academic cooperative groups to demonstrate the value, the safety, the efficacy, the PK. And they are still off-label. Most of them are off-patent. It's because no company dared to submit the data to any agency to get a full label. Having said that, it should not be asked to any company, because they won't, to submit any information which we know already, which is published already, as seen in our paper, that they are relevant and should be proposed to the patient. So the issue of off-label should not, resolving the off-label is not through asking companies to submit the data of these off-patent medicines. Need to be addressed accessed and a toposite should be available even though there is no label saying or carboplatin. You know, even in Europe, carboplatin is still not recommended in the SMPC of these generics for the treatment of pediatric malignancies. That was just, this is not the solution to ask the companies to do so. We need to make a solution without them. That's the point. André, do you have the solution? I was going to let uh, Guillermo, please. Guillermo, do you want to go first and I can share uh, some inputs. Thanks, Kathy. Oh, no, no, please go ahead. So uh, just to say what are uh, a few points of feedback. One is we, we also want to map this out. So uh, there is a colleague within WHO that's working within the platform, uh, Dr. Jessica Bachlin, who has looked at all products that have been developed and are being used in childhood cancer from the past 20 years and those that are in the pipeline. So we can define which ones have been approved in children and which regulatory authorities provided feedback in its use in those populations in which the regulatory has done a proper, uh, let's say, uh, proposal review. I agree with Gilles. It does not change for the purposes of the platform what products are being made available through the platform. It is a national decision and does not rely on regulatory authorities for which a participating member state will not have jur jurisdiction over. So from our perspective, there are concordance reviews as to whether or not it's aligned with what's considered best practice. And that's done through a validation of applications to the EML and through expert consensus through networks that this platform has and will develop. But it will not restrain it unless it's a product outside the EML. And that's why I really appreciate the work that Gilles and others are doing to make sure the EML remains up to date. Those are the products for which we will have to explore alternate mechanisms because those will not be included in the short term in the, the platform uh, catalog itself. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Andrea and, and Jules, I, I, I totally agree. I have li li little less to, to, to say. So just a couple of comments that the newly uh, labeled drugs sometimes are labeled with the indication and dosages of high income countries. So perhaps these are not, uh, it may, may not necessarily be the same use and dosages that we in low and middle income countries would benefit from. So that would also create some tension and, and, and some uh, regulatory office would say that uh, we should use it as exactly the same as they are labeled. So I think, I think this is always uh, some room for innovation in low and middle income countries and try to come up with the, uh, the dose and the schedule that these uh, particular drugs could bring benefit in our populations, which may be different from uh, high income countries. Okay, hey, thank you. So could I now go to the question posed by Vic Canwa about how Atom and, and the global platform will work uh, together or synergize? Um, maybe Melissa and Andre, you take in whichever order you wish to. I, I defer first to my, my fabulous colleague from WHO. <laughs> oh, Melissa, we're like family. <laughs> yes, so, right. Just, just to say one brief uh, comment, because I want to acknowledge uh, Guillermo's great point. So one of the elements that we hope this platform will also bring is because this, uh, this platform requires end-to-end -end support, we will also have a better understanding of every child that receives cancer therapy for what indication and whether or not they've completed therapy. So in principle, that's the beginning of a broad network that can be used to build clinical trial capacities and ask research questions that are much more relevant to a local context. So for us, Guillermo, your point really has resonated because this is a unique opportunity. We know that in high income countries, the vast majority of children benefit from clinical trials. That is not true and it has consequences. So in that pipeline analysis that I was referencing earlier that Dr. Buckland and others are working on, we're also looking at what countries have these clinical trials be, been run in for childhood cancer specifically. And we don't have the results yet, but of course it's not going to be a surprise over 90% are in high income countries. So how can we advise when we don't know the feasibility, the appropriateness, the dosing, when we're talking about a completely different setting? So this is something, again, this is on our horizon. This platform has the, a new opportunity because we need to have better surveillance from the product being imported to the country to how it's being administered and disposed. So we will have a much better understanding for the indications. And then that's, again, a mechanism for us to build clinical trial networks. Now, sorry, Melissa, to, to distract from the very important point on how will we work together. You know, I think all of us in this community can appreciate that one of the reasons childhood cancer has been so successful is because there is solidarity and there's a belief in collaboration. There is not a sense of competition in this community. So we believe the same thing is true for how we engage with our own partners internal to the childhood cancer. And the same thing, uh, of course, with Adam. UICC is a very dear partner to WHO. They're an NGO in official relations. We have a longstanding history of collaborating with them. And we have been uh, observers and supporting Adam, just like the Adam Coalition is supporting the work of WHO, St. Jude, and the platform. How will it work at the country level? For us, that's the greatest interest because at the end of the day, broader MOUs, they will have merit, but it doesn't change that we can assure you, and Melissa can vouch, that we have routine dialogues and we indeed are also having a follow-up workshop in the near future building on discussions that we've had to date. What we also need to ensure is that when it gets to countries, people see this again as a partnership within a broader community. Childhood cancer will succeed through these initiatives because it's not the platform at a global level, Adam at a global level, it's what happens on the ground. And so in the short term, while we figure out a lot of the mechanics, what we all want to focus on is country driven leadership. And that, in fact, is what we're all committed to. So both of us are approaching countries in the near future, and you can all be assured that we'll do so in a way that reflects one voice for the childhood cancer community, not two. Or not more, because again, I think Adam and, and, and this platform are two important partners, but we heard of other ones like the International Health Partners today. We all know GFAOP has done great work. So we, we're building on a legacy and the best legacy is to do these together, not again to come with a program and a brand. A child that receives a cancer medicine could absolutely care less as to where it came from. They just want to have the medicine. So while again, let's, we, we will maintain that cohesion in the community. That's what we all believe in. So Melissa, please, over to you. 
No, and I totally agree. You know, one of the things too that's important to mention is that um, above and beyond just the Atom Coalition, you know, UICC is a is a membership organization, right? We have 1,200 members in over 120 plus countries, right? Many of those also work in the pediatrics ca cancer space, as you know. St. Jude is a member, SIAP is a member. So the idea is also to be able to leverage the work that we have and that we do continually with partners, but also to take advantage of all of a tremendous amount of work that's gone into the platform and developing it. I mean, Andre has given you just a little snippet of a lot of the background work that's been going on at WHO and with partners on the pediatric cancer and how to do access for the last two years. And so what we want to do too is build on that and see how we can leverage to be able to work jointly, like Andre said, at the global, not only the global level, but at the country level, you know, and take advantage of the partnerships that we have and be able to really convene countries, stakeholders that are really going to be able to have impact, but most importantly, be able to work with WHO in particular and how we talk to countries, right? Because as we know, particularly for low and middle income countries, who purchases the bulk of meds, right? It's governments, but also the NGO sector, the very few limited private sector channels. So it's really important for us to be able to shine a light collectively with governments to help to help kind of change the tide in the way that they see and prioritize cancer, right? And how we can help them along the way find innovative financing to be able to sustain that, but also make sure that we have um, really good best practice to be able to ensure that we have access from the moment it arrives in country to, to, to the moment that it's distributed to patients, right? So we intend to keep on working and we will collaborate. As Andre said, we're gonna be doing a lot of workshops and on specific scopes of work that we wanna do together. And if we can get it done, as we say in Spanish, it will be una bomba. So. So I think in order to keep to time and let everyone um, get home um, or onto their working day, I would like to wrap up the webinar now. Uh, Suzanne has got a very appropriate uh, final picture to share with us, which also comes from a, a Spanish background and uh I, Suzanne, if you want to share your screen and show the photograph, um, I think this is just a reminder of how much efforts in childhood cancer and success um, are the results of a big team effort. And this was a, a wonderful uh, part of the opening ceremony of uh, the SIOP 2022 Congress in Barcelona, uh, where there's a tradition of building what are called human towers that allow the very smallest child to stand at the very top of the pyramid and feel safe and supported. And I believe that's what we've tried to demonstrate uh, in this webinar today is how we're all working together to achieve that magnificent endpoint in the foreseeable future now for so many children. Um, and I'd just like to thank again all the speakers and particularly my co-host, uh, Piera Fricero from World Child Cancer and the uh, SIOP Secretariat, Suzanne Wallet and Anelia Anastova for their technical support. And I think we all know that uh, support does go, uh, well, there's always technical issues in a Zoom webinar, but uh, we overcame them. But we'll try and ensure that the videos are put correctly in the recording so that the recording of the webinar will, won't have all the glitches that we did experience tonight. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Kathy. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.